everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I appreciate that you're all here today to talk about um, speculate climate futures in this time when um, there are so many climate disasters affecting um, people here. And can everyone see my screen okay? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, I'm going to just start with the grounding and say um, today we're sort of in the midst of Hurricane Helen's destruction. Um, and we're also in this moment of anticipating the landfall of Hurricane Milton. So I just want to hold space for um, the grief that accompanies um, discussions about climate and the intensification of these catastrophes in our time. And there is um, a compiled list of mutual aid um, resources here. I personally don't have connections in Appalachia or Florida, but um, yeah, I just invite everyone to take care in this time. And sort of the built-in check-in question are land stories, which um, includes whose traditional territory you live on. Um, and if you're not sure, there is um, this website where you can check or use, you know, any search engine, what traditional um, territories your ancestors um, were from, and also what is your current relationality to these people and your positionality on these changing lands in this moment of climate collapse. And I can kind of use this moment also to... Um, you know, introduce myself, but feel free to write it in the chat and I can share some of the responses um, as well as they come through. But I'm currently based in Massachusetts on the traditional territory of the Massachusetts people, but my family is from Mi'kma'ki or um, the settler colonial lands that are currently known as Nova Scotia and New Brunswick in so-called Canada. And these are the traditional lands of the Mi'kmaq, Wallastukik, and Passamaquoddy. And I personally have mixed Black and Euro settler ancestry. And um, as was mentioned, like my Black ancestors reached that area as self-emancipated, formerly enslaved refugees pre-Confederation, so before Canada existed. And um, there are very close relationships with the Mi'kmaq and in these first harsh winters, um, Black communities injured a lot of exchange of knowledge and local land-based practices were essential for survival. And today both communities face higher risks of environmental toxicity due to the proximity of dumping grounds. So that's just some of the context of why this intersection of race and space and ecology is so foundational to how I understand um, the environment as an architectural designer, a landscape designer, and a resilience planner. And also why throughout my work, I really emphasize Black and Indigenous relationality a lot. Um, and yeah, we're sort of uh, in this moment where um, our struggles for survival have always been intertwined and it's becoming more and more clear that these struggles will continue to be intertwined into the future. And so coalition is needed now more than ever. Um, it doesn't look like anyone else has responded to the check-in question yet, but I can wait a moment or feel free. Maybe a couple people could also like unmute if they want to, it doesn't have to be that comprehensive I'm just yeah but if not you can put it in the chat and people can read um as I continue okay I mean if you want to you can you can just continue writing in the chat oh wait Tu says their family or his family is from the Mekong Delta in Vietnam. And Mary um, is originally from Ethiopia, but um, was raised and lives on Nam Cake land. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that and is from the Amhara ethnic group um, and has a very diasporic relationship to land. And... Oh yeah, Dorchester is on Massachusetts or Pawtucket land, but Jules is from Missoula, 
Montana, though on Salish land. Oh, cool. I was born on Salish land. And yeah, Ray, coming from Massachusetts territory and originally from Anishinaabe land. Thank you for sharing. I appreciate it. Um, and yeah, a lot of my work is grounded in just like how we frame our relationships to each other on land. So I like to start that way. Um, but otherwise, um, yeah, what I'll say is that Black and Indigenous people um, on Turtle Island have in many ways already survived the end of the world. We're descendants of people um, who have survived genocide, dispossession of land, dispossession of personhood, systematic dehumanization and enslavement. And so a big question is just like, how have we collectively survived settler colonialism in the past? Um, and how are we collectively surviving the ongoing conditions of our settler colonial context now in the present? Um, imagining our future on these lands is therefore also an act of remembering. And through acts of remembrance with and for the land and each other, um, we can think about how to carry forward past liberatory frameworks into the future. And I personally see speculative world building as something that has the potential um, to be one of these liberatory frameworks for spatial design practices, because we first have to be able to imagine the futures we hope to inhabit. And today, as physical and social infrastructure increasingly erodes, I don't truly believe that the Federal Emergency Management Agency will save us. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers definitely won't save us, and both are operating within um, these frameworks rooted in extractive mindsets that were formed during a period of colonial expansion. So how can we design together grassroots social infrastructure for and by our communities to respond to these intensifying climate disasters? And um, this next section is more so about remembering. Um, and so I started with this quote by um, Edouard Glissant, who is a Martinique scholar and theorist. And um, he wrote in Caribbean discourse, so history is spread out beneath the surface, from the mountains to the sea, from north to south, from the forest to the beaches, maroon resistance and denial, entrenchment and endurance, the world beyond and dream. Our landscape is its own monument. Its meaning can only be traced on the underside. It is all history. And so I'd like to first bring us to the Mississippi um, to talk about water as an element in the landscape that has um, perfect memory. This is a map by Harold Fisk, who um, worked for the Army Corps of Engineers in the 1940s, and he was a geologist and cartographer and was tracing this meandering shoreline that changed many times of the Mississippi River from Illinois all the way to Louisiana. And um, it's sort of important as a drawing and a document because rivers are... Um, constantly shifting entities, even though they're um, historically represented as stationary bodies um, in European mapping processes. And so to me, it's like highly unprecedented that someone who works for the Army Corps would produce this document because typically they treat the landscape and the environment as an entity that can be contained for colonial expansion and also the development of the built environment, which oftentimes is just an extension of that. And it's also important because you can often predict where flooding will occur based on the historic footprints of bodies of water that have been built over or drained. Um, and so yes, water is, a living entity. And Toni Morrison actually talked about this a lot um, and merged her understanding with water and landscape as a site of memory with her writing practice. And she wrote that, um, or said, that the act of imagination is bound up with memory. You know, they straightened out the Mississippi River in places to make room for houses and livable acreage. 
Occasionally, the river floods these places. Floods is the words they use, but in fact, it is not flooding. It is remembering. Remembering where it used to be. All water has a perfect memory and is forever trying to get back to where it was. Writers are like that, remembering where we were, what valley we ran through, what the banks were like, the light that was there, and the route back to our original place. It is emotional memory, what the nerves and the skin remember, as well as how it appeared. And a rush of imagination is our flooding. And so related to that, um, to bring us back to the Mississippi, I'd say um, levees in the South and especially along the Mississippi um, were built by enslaved Black people and later through convict leasing. And I'll add that right now um, there are incarcerated people in Florida who are working on flood infrastructure preparing for Milton. So to this day, um, but with the levees, it was to drain what's called the back swamps. And these areas previously periodically flooded and had adaptive vegetation that mediated impact on the landscape and had smaller natural levees, which are mounds of sediment that naturally occurred in the riparian landscape to mediate levels of flooding. You can sort of see this cross section to the right that describes that. Um, but when taller levees were built by forcible labor, the drained back swamps enabled settlers not only to dispossess land from local indigenous peoples all along the Mississippi, which is a huge river, but it also allowed them to convert the land into monocrop plantations through which they also dispossessed enslaved blacks of their personhood for highly extractive land use practices. So today when extreme storm surge or flooding causes the levees to overtop, the water is essentially remembering these low-lying areas that used to be um, riparian zones and wetlands that habitually flooded. And because settlers have constructed the built environment to live against or without the water as opposed to finding ways of living with the water adaptively and reciprocally, the failure of um, this infrastructure that's now federally regulated has really disastrous impacts. Um, and so a huge question of our time is how can we engage with water as a technology of remembrance through which we can imagine other ways of living reciprocally and adaptively with the landscapes around us? Um, and then in terms of water as a site of memory and remembering as an essential part of envisioning the future, I really like this concept of Afrofabulation. Um, scholars such as Sadia Hartman and Tina Camp talk about it a lot, but the way I'll describe it today is how Tina Camp explains it, which is um, inhabiting the time space of the subjunctive real conditional, which sounds like linguistic nonsense, but what she describes it as um, that I actually find really compelling is um, replacing the declarative grammar of the present or this is with the subjunctive real conditional grammar of that which will have had to have happened through which it becomes possible to create a radical provocation to see blackness differently and in doing so to create a path to living Blackness differently, not in the future, but now. And so I see speculative climate features as a form of fabulation in the space of landscape as an archive, and also a site of sacred memory to imagine that which will have had to happen. And um, spiritual connections to land can often be understood in this context through stories, music, and other forms of cultural production, um, and as a form of poetics of the landscape. Um, these are means of transcending beyond traditional archives or forms of historicization to envision more relational ways of being rooted in the environment and um, understood, you know, not only through, um, singular facts that are documented in a sterile way, but also through um, speculation, imagination, and artistic innovation. And um, wetlands are sort of the sites of marinage that I focus on in my research personally. 
Um, although many peripheral landscapes, both literal in terms of like mountains, forests, wetlands, but also metaphorically in terms of like people who are um, dehumanized or socially marginalized are relegated to those spaces. Um, there are many types of landscapes that are maroon landscapes, but in the US specifically wetlands are a very common one. And um, so maroon societies um, in Grand Marinage is when enslaved Black people fled the plantation and created their own societies, right? So um, Black fugitive world building is this means of creating a radical space that's outside of the colonial paradigm and how people are extractively um, operating in the larger world and um, creating these interior worlds within worlds in which it's possible to actually practice the land-based um, and spiritual ceremonies that um, are systemically you know, erased and disenfranchised from colonized people. And I really like how the Zapatistas of Chiapas describe a world in which many worlds can exist um, and imagine you know, maroon societies as an interior world. And then there's also this ecological concept of ecotones, which essentially just means a transitional landscape, in this case, between land and water. Um, and that is also both literally and metaphorically a point of contact between Black and Indigenous peoples that um, al allows them to defy colonial conquest. Um, and historically, um, land in Native studies is overdefined with Indigenous people and water um, in Black studies because of the space of the Middle Passage, where Black people um, in the Americas are seen as landlessness and in a condition of constant placelessness, um, makes there be an over association um, with blackness and water. And so the ecotone or wetlands are a point of interaction, but also because quite literally in these maroon societies, there is often interaction between both groups and many interrelations. And um, I won't get too far into that today, but Wetlands are also spaces that have historically defied enclosure into property and colonial expansion because it wasn't easy to productively, productively use the land for um, agriculture or um, to settle um, it domestically for houses. And so people who were um, dehumanized were sent to these places or relegated to these places that were considered uninhabitable. And this image is from the Great Dismal Swamp in Virginia. Um, and it's one of the more famous um, swamps where there is a lot of maroon activity. Um, but then also wetlands are um, a site of and um, yeah, a site of memory for colonial resistance. Um, for example, in Florida, the Seminole Wars took place in which Black people who escaped enslavement, Seminoles, and also Afro-Indigenous people within Seminole tribes um, resisted through military tactics and understandings of the landscape, the encroachment of Andrew Jackson and his troops. And there was also, um, for example, this 1811 German coast insurrection in New Orleans, um, which there is an image of to the right that was almost almost successful, but unfortunately not. Um, but yeah, and I also like to see wetlands as ancestors or um, um, as Imani, Imani Jacqueline Brown, an artist from New Orleans, describes them, she says that wetlands are fecund cradles of more than human life, which the enlightened human classifies beneath whiter sands and bluer waters, which despite this degradation and debasement remain merciful hosts to migrating maroons of all species. And so she sort of understands kinship and relationships to land as um, being outside of like the 
solely, you know, human nexus of life. And finally, to bring it back to storytelling, wetlands are also places of social marginalization uh, or that host people that experience social marginalization historically, as I mentioned, and this is tied to, um, you know, the development of a lot of monsters in folklore, including the Rougarou, the Honey Island Swamp Monster, the Chupacabra, Boo Hags, and Haints. And so I definitely see folklore as a means of understanding the um, environment in, um, you know, Black legacies because there's this beautiful intertwining of both what is seen maybe more objectively as truth in a mainstream way, but also um, fiction that has like emotional connotations of how people are relating to the environment. And finally, I'll just quickly talk about hoodoo and then we can have some questions, but um, another large part of what makes the swamp such a powerful place is its capacity to heal. And the roots that foragers gathered from its interior um, were something that um, is representative of this. And it became the site where secretly hoodoo ceremonies could be practiced and through which divine ancestors um, inherited from the motherland were re-encountered. And um, Zora Neale Hurston, um, amazing anthropologist, documented so much of this throughout her lifetime. And she had done a lot of apprenticeships with root workers in Louisiana, including someone named Dr. Duke, who was the only swamper left, which is a root and conjure doctor who forages his own herbs and roots from local swamps and forests. And even in Zora's time, this was really considered a disappearing school of folk magic. But what Dr. Duke's unique practice demonstrates is how Black traditional ecological knowledge continues to be passed down ancestral lineages to this day. And in shadowing him, she discovers the many intricacies involved in understanding both the ecological and spiritual implications of root harvesting in Louisiana swamps. And so beyond just a basic understanding of what roots should actually be harvested, there's also ceremonial codes that are adhered to um, and just this general culture of respect for other living things that are being guarded um, within the swamp's belly. And this culture of care is definitely also extended to human community members, obviously, who were seeking services and because of historical and present in access to mainstream mainstream Western healthcare for Black folks. Root work has just had this very long legacy of being a liberatory and culturally relevant and more accessible medical alternative, um, not only in the colonial era, but also post-emancipation and to this day. And so um, it's not only um, an indication of a framework of resourcefulness and redistribution of available goods and conditions of scarcity, but it also demonstrates just the extent to which kidnapped Africans were able to adapt traditional knowledge specific to various regions of Western and Central Africa to completely new e ecosystems that they encountered in a new hemisphere, uh, which is what we call bioregional herbalism. And that was an absolutely critical survival mechanism. And so, um, yeah, this adaptability to new contexts is just one of the most powerful aspects of Black cultural preservation. And Hurston um, writes that it would be impossible for anyone to find out all the things that are being used to conjure in America. Anything may be conjure and nothing may be conjure according to the doctor, the time and the use of the article. And so I think that really embodies um, this um, amazing adaptability that I was describing. And I would just also lastly add that some of this knowledge wasn't just brought over from the Middle Passage, but existed because of interactions between Black and Indigenous people in these spaces where um, there was a shared history of survival. 
And so that was a lot, but um, yeah, I'm open to having questions and more of a dialogue now before we do the activity. I have a question. Yeah. I don't know if that's a, uh, but I'm just curious about in terms of practicing that, the, first of all, I just want to say like, I loved um, that, uh, everything about that presentation. <laughs> it was just, mm -hmm. um, I always say you, it, it was awesome. Um, but in terms of bioregional herbalism um, and particularly, you know, obviously recognizing you know, what's happening in Florida, but then also recognizing where we, where we are uh, in Massachusetts of like, what are some of the ways that, um, that you know of, or like to start, begin applying those in a day-to-day -day practice? Um, yeah, I mean, I've been trying to develop more plant knowledge. I was like apprenticing with an herbalist in Oakland and I think it can take time, but we just, I think it just starts with understanding how many of the plants around us we see every day that we don't realize are like medicinal or that there have been like these historical, like sacred practices that maybe our ancestors had, but that have been like suppressed through colonial knowledge production systems. Um, a lot of things are considered to be weeds but, you know, like stinging nettles are medicinal, um, burdock. Um, I'm doing a project right now about mugwort. And this landscape architect told me that he's he's like, oh, damn, I hate mugwort. I'm always trying to clear it out of my sights. And I'm like, I don't I don't know. It's it's a, an amazing like dreaming herb and like calming agent. And it can also be like smoked. And so I think um yeah, I think it just starts with like a mind shift, but also that um, we all have to be actively learning more about what's around us in our environment. Because I try to imagine like if there was a huge disaster that hit us like today where we were, like would most of the people I know realize that there are things around them that are like edible or that can that, that they can use to you know, address like certain medical issues because I feel unprepared, but now I've been like working at it for a few years. So I think it's just to me a life project and a culture shift, but I don't know if that answers your question. Well, I think it answers it as good as it can be. <laughs> I, But that's really cool that you've had all this experience. So thank you, thank you for that. Yeah, of course. Oh, cool. So Carolyn or Caroline, I'm not sure, asked um, about how Indigenous and Black people can use these ideas to continue claiming Boston as Boston um, what, or in areas that are artificially built on the rising ocean. OK, I'm not sure exactly what you mean, but I will say, um, yeah, the seaport is a wild place because it, yeah, a lot of Boston was also wetlands and I'm still learning this because I'm not from here, but in terms of like really recent, like real estate development, the seaport is a really wild place that should not have been developed and is both exclusionary and built in an area that will be like impacted a lot by sea level rise and um, by, yeah, flooding and storm surge because it's low lying and I think it might have formerly been a wetland, but it doesn't really make sense for them to be doing all that to be to be real. Um, yeah, and then I know that East Cambridge apparently used to be separated from the rest of the city of Cambridge because there was a wetland, and that's kind of why like the streetscape is very different, um, and it's not organized in the same way, and it has also kind of a different culture and a vibe. Um, but in general, I think the waterfronts of most cities used to be wetlands or oceans. Like I used to 
work on the San Francisco waterfront and the projected flooding almost exactly aligned with the natural shoreline and people just threw like literal garbage after the earthquake in the 80s into some areas and it had been like filled in with artificial human materials since maybe yeah the foundation of the city like centuries ago so um I don't really think that we should displace people and say like people can't live there anymore but I also think that um there are ways that we can like soften the shoreline so that we have more of a connection to it instead of just having like a seawall or like industrial areas or um things like that like we can do well in restoration restoration and hopefully that can be through like cultural frameworks and not just um through the lens of ecology in a sterile way that doesn't recognize like ancestral practices but yeah Jules did you have another question hi diva here I'm with Jules um um I really love the reframing of the swamp as a place that is safe rather than dangerous. Um, when you're speaking about the maroon communities, it triggered the memory of um, something that I learned. Uh, I grew up in Michigan and supposedly the slave catchers wouldn't go to Michigan because there was a myth that there were like terrible swamps there and you would get sick and you would just like get lost and immediately die if you went to Michigan. So when Black people got to Michigan, they're just like, oh, I don't even need to get the rest of the way to Canada. And that's how a huge part of the Black community that was pre-industrial revolution got to Michigan. And it's so I just, interesting. yeah, I don't have a question per se. I just wanted to share that because it like reinforces this new worldview that is like developing in my brain as I speak about what swamps are. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. swamps are depicted in media and fiction as just like gross and disgusting and scary alligator's gonna get you but it doesn't have to be that yeah no that's beautiful like thank you so much for sharing that and there's so much more I want to learn about Michigan I just bought Kyle Mays's book an Afro-Indigenous history of the United States and he talks about like Detroit area and like the border region and to me, that's really interesting also because I feel like, I don't know, like as a person whose ancestors like settled in Canada before it was even Canada and people see that as them reaching safety, I just know like the history of how that actually wasn't a safe place. And I think even within swamps, there is this continued condition of like fugitivity where people are always trying to come for like your literal head or um, re-enslave you or um, yeah, suppress like these interior worlds. But I also want to be able to have the safety of imagining like spaces that existed, even if only for a time where people did have their, you know, traditional like cultural practices and um, were, were operating with like a sense of self-determination. And so, um, but yeah, no, that was beautiful. I want to learn more about Michigan now. Yeah, maybe we can shift to breakout rooms because what I organized is about 20-ish um, minutes, but um yeah yeah I think things always take like a few more minutes and I can have time to explain exactly you know what we're going to be doing in those three rooms so this last part I called fabulation but it's the speculative world building workshop part where you actually get to interact with each other 
And um, it's framed around this quote from Octavia Butler, the goddess of speculative fiction, who said, I didn't make up the problems. All I did was look around at the problems for neglecting now and give them about 30 years to grow into full-fledged disasters. And so the time frame being used is 30 years for this. And yeah, you'll organize into small groups or actually we'll just place you into breakout rooms. You don't have to do any organizing. And then there are three sections. There's the world building, then there's world or ro role setting, and then there's asset mapping. And then at the end we can um, share back and so this is going to be the first question, and then we can divide you up into breakout groups and we'll follow up, giving you the additional prompts every five minutes. But the world building question is to collectively speculate how social and planetary disaster shapes the lands in your climate zone 30 years in the future. Um, and so to make it more of like a a thick description as like an author would maybe say like what is the sensory experience of these lands in 2053 but also um how have the social and spatial conditions shifted in response to these events so yeah that is the first prompt and we can divide you all up all right, so we uh, the breakout rooms are now open. They're as equally balanced as could be. Um, so each breakout room has four people in them, but people are leaving. So it might be four or three. Um, and Simone, you have not been placed in the breakout room, so you can hop into whichever ones you feel. Okay, like. cool. All right, and they are open. Feel free to join your rooms. There will be a staff, Ujima staff person helping to take notes in each breakout room. So feel free to join. Hey, thank you for everyone who stayed for the workshop part. I would love to hear what happened in the other breakout room or if anyone who is in the same one as me would want to talk about some of the things we shared with each other. That would be sick. Okay, we can summarize our breakout group um image of half submerged skyscrapers where people are now growing vegetables and herbs and the poor people living in the trees and the rich people living in towers because the water has come back in and there's nowhere to go but up that's that's yeah. the image Yeah, we talked about trees a lot, but is there anyone from the other one who would like to share? I will not force anyone to speak, but I would love to hear. I will share something. That's cool. We didn't discuss like a particular image like that. So there was the similarity of like water and flooding and like I had even brought up like the city being underwater essentially. So. Your, the image y'all described was just a bit more specific and wow. Um, something that I brought up in the group was like the role of art and music. There was that question of like, what skills do you have that you could bring, you know, in situations like this and looking towards the future? And I felt a little bit of doubt with it. <laughs> like how, how are... How is my job and my mission here in my life right now going to be helpful to this effort? Um, but after some discussion, it, it does make sense. We talked about joy and like the cultivation of joy is something that is a tool. That is something that can help inspire hope and faith for moving forward. And it can also nurture us. Um, we also talked a little bit about like, uh, less of a hierarchy when it comes to collaborating with community members to create or to adapt. And again, I had originally brought up the idea we were, we were like all talking about like, um, I guess more intellectual, like how we have those kinds of skills, like planning, abstract thinking, 
Um, and how working with community members, it almost felt like there was the gap of like, well, how do we actually build this and create this, right? Like we have all these ideas, but how do we actually make it? And so uh, one of my group members had brought up, you know, like collaborating with builders, you know, at the at the same time, instead of having like, I have this plan and here you go and create it. And I really liked that you brought that up. I think it was Avanti, but <laughs> I'll say that. I'm sorry if I left anything out, but those are the things that stood out the most to me in our discussion. Uh, thank you for sharing. Um, it sounds like you had a really generative conversation, but um, yeah, our time is over. So thank you so much for coming and for staying for the workshop portion. And um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Can we give a round of applause to Simone? You absolutely can. Mm -hmm. Show Simone some love. Yes. Simone, if people had more questions, how is there a way they can get in touch with you if they're like, ooh, this sparks something in me? Oh, yeah. Maybe I can put my email and Instagram in the chat because I don't know if people email, but I can do both. That's really the only social media I use, though.